Hey guys, and welcome to 015, version 15 is out. And uh, this is going to be an overview video where I cover the major features that are included in this update. Now there are quite a few of these. The entire change log is about eight pages long. So I'm obviously not gonna cover all of that. I've written down the major features. I've gone through the whole thing and written down the main features, which I'm gonna go over. Uh, I will link in the description where you can go and check out the main change log. And then I will also put in a paste bin or something, uh, my notes, if you just want to read the major features as well. But, uh, but yeah, so we're gonna get right into it here. First things first is you now have advanced map generation settings. So uh, when we go into, into the game here, we go to play a new game, there's actually quite a few new options. Uh, the preset, you have different presets. So default is obviously just default. Rich resources um, makes all the resources rich. And what this, this actually changes the resource settings over here, right? You can see richness very good. So this is stuff that you could just do on your own, but these are presets if you just uh, want an easy method or maybe new to the game and not quite sure how to mess with these yet. So that's that's that. Uh, marathon, recipes and technologies are more expensive. So similar to the Marathon mod, uh, obviously a different, different multipliers and such, but a similar idea. Uh, dangerous biters are more dangerous and evolve faster, mainly the time-based evolution is faster, so you shouldn't stall too much. So that's kind of, I guess, like maybe a pre-death world, uh, like a little step below a death world. And then actual death world. And this is actually interesting because they've kind of gone twofold here in terms of the difficulty. Only select this if you're a factory veteran. Recipes and technologies are expensive and biters are dangerous and plentiful. So not only does it increase biter settings, it actually increases your recipes and technologies uh, price as well which is quite interesting. And then the last one is kind of like a built-in RSO, but not quite the same. And again, it changes just these settings. So it's pretty much just setting the frequency of everything to low, size to big type of thing. So if you just want a preset for a world where resources are more spread out and, and it encourages trains, you can do this. But this is a very interesting thing here to note, guys, at the end. Biters won't create any new bases or re-expand into clear territory. This, so this is very cool, like for a mega base like Colonel Will's Mega Base 2.0 and probably my mega base, uh, I may choose something like this because what this does, right, is it has biters on the map. Uh, you can st still turn on peaceful and such, but what this means is that, you know, you need to push out the biters to like build, but once you get rid of them, they're not going to be constantly hammering against your walls trying to expand. Obviously, they'll still attack if they're not on peaceful due to your pollution aggro factors and such, but they're not going to be constantly re-expanding all around your base. It pretty much just turns off the expansion, which is kind of nice. So once you clear them out, they're not coming back to that area, aside from attacks. So then over in our advanced settings, there's all kind of stuff you can mess with. You can enable and disable all this stuff, and then you can just change these factors uh, massively, really, uh, for pollution, diffusion ratio, Amount of uh, pollution diffused into neighboring chunks per second, dissipation, damage to trees, absorb per damage tree, uh, evolution, time factor, and destroy factor, and pollution factor, and uh, you know you can bump these up or down however much you want. Enemy expansion, you can change all of these, um, and then there's just a tick box for enable and disable, which is awesome because. If you wanted that setting like that the real world had for this, you can enable it. And then if you don't want the real world resource settings, you could just go in here and do whatever you want and enable this. Uh, and then recipe technologies, we have normal and expensive for recipes, technology, normal and expensive, or you can just flat out multiply your tech costs. So you could almost do like a uh, kind of SpaceX, a little bit different. Um, but you, you know, you could just say like, just boom, I want all my techs to be five times more expensive. And stuff like that a reset button absolutely awesome uh, so that's that next thing is map seed is used to generate unique maps instead of just shifting the starting position so if you didn't know uh previously to a 015 update everyone actually started on the same exact map just a different part in the map um it was never actually unique uh, in, in terms of the map itself the map was not unique uh, but they've changed it so now that it is each map is unique and uh Let's see, so 
later on they're adding the red desert biome uh, it got delayed a little bit but hopefully just a couple weeks maybe a month at the most they are adding it into 15 just not in this initial release and they added mini tutorials so we can check those out if we go here and just generate a new map and go into it here uh, you can see this little kind of hat icon this is your tutorial so far there's only rail tutorials uh, but they do plan to add more over time so if we go into like advanced rail signals um, so this will I'm not gonna go through the whole thing obviously but um, this brings you into kind of a separate thing and uh, this will tell you you know what's going on you continue um, and it kind of explains things as you go so if you're newer to the game and uh, or even if you're not but still have issues with trains then this would definitely be something to check out and then it just brings you back into here uh, so another one another huge thing is they did tons and tons of optimizations uh, just to name a few of the big ones they improved mining drill performance when mining drills get backed up so this is uh, up until this point essentially what would happen is mining drills would always be uh, their active state would always pretty much they would just always be active in terms of how the game calculates stuff even if they're backed up like going into a chest right so you would just have you know hundreds or thousands of mining drills just pretty much always taking up performance but they've changed it so that when a mining drill backs up that it just kind of it just turns inactive it just isn't even counted until it turns back on again once it gets unbacked up so that helps a ton uh, significantly changed GUI performance so I'm, I'm sure most of you have experienced uh, you know when you open a GUI and there's a whole ton of stuff going on it drops your FPS and even UPS quite a lot they've uh, helped that a lot uh, improved train performance when building mining rail related entities so if you have had a map with tons of rails and tons of trains like our 015 simulation uh, multiplayer thing I've done with Will if any of you watch that you'll know what we're talking about what I'm talking about with the rail lag when you like picked up a track right it would it would just create a lag spike um, if you had enough rails and trains they fixed that pretty much completely and circuit network performance increased up to 25 times less CPU usage and 10% less memory usage so to give an example I'm gonna load up I have our 015 simulation map this was a save um, this is our latest save in 014 in version 14 in single player I got about 75 UPS with this uh, that was the max I could get and in multiplayer I couldn't really get more than about 55 um, in multiplayer I tested with Will and there were like four other guys on earlier today we were getting about 110 UPS when I load this in single player this is a massive this is nearly double performance increase just to show you guys and yeah so I mean this is a big base you know we're doing this is actually like the base is actually pretty much off at this point you know 35k iron a minute quite a bit but usually it's about 100k it's creeping up if I turn on or if I increase my game speed here you'll see what I'm able to get with this uh, let's just I can now get 140 UPS in this map in single player so it is almost double or even double or more from 014 so massive performance increases and uh and yeah i mean this is a big map i mean we have like 250 trains and uh, all this smelting stuff it's massive performance increases so i just wanted to show you that now I'll actually hop into the super exciting in-game stuff okay i wanted to just cover that so we can get out of the menu you know crap uh, first of all and actually go into game here so uh one other thing i want to mention is they've removed alien artifacts from the game completely uh, they're just no longer in the game anything that required them no longer requires them uh, the alien science packs have been replaced with production packs which I'll go over once we hop into the game here uh, so alien artifacts no longer a thing so let's hop in this is a map I prepared um, I am in cheat mode because it's just easier to deal with stuff and demonstrate but uh, I just will go down the list here so research overhaul three new packs military production and high tech so military packs are a new pack which you make from military items production packs which require a pump jack engine and furnace 
And this is what replaced the alien science packs and high tech science packs, which are really quite expensive uh, when you look at the materials here. Uh, but do keep in mind that for these three, these last three, you do get two per cycle. So that's an important note. And then they've also changed the recipe of the uh, science pack three. They've changed the recipe of the blue packs to require an advanced circuit in engine and an assembler. Okay. So there's that. And then they've also added space science packs, which you can't craft because you actually get these guys from launching a rocket, which I'll just demonstrate now. So when you launch a rocket, now you get a thousand space science packs. So when you launch a rocket, it'll dump the science packs right here where it says rocket inventory. And then you'll have to unload them. And then they are used for pretty much all your infinite research past the initial few levels. So it kind of, it's kind of a nice, kind of close out loop if you will you know before launching rocket didn't really do much for you and then if they once they added infinite science you would have pretty much just ignored rockets in terms of actually being able to gain something science would have been your main goal but now they're tied together right because now you have to launch rockets to get higher levels of infinite science which i really like so what i'm going to do is i'm going to launch this and there's now an option to auto launch a rocket um auto launch with satellite so what this will do uh, as you might imagine, is it'll just auto launch the rocket without me having to even do anything once it gets a satellite. So what I'm going to do is get rid of that and launch. So it'll just launch and we'll get some science packs here and then we're going to unload them. Now you do have to be, I'm sorry if that's loud, all my sound settings got completely reset. Let's turn that down a little bit. Okay, so you do have to be a bit careful with this because if you um, launch too many, it'll actually you'll actually lose science packs because this will back up, and then when you launch a rocket, the science packs will just not go in here; they'll just disappear. So uh, I believe this can hold two thousand, which is actually a full stack. These things stack in two thousands, which is pretty interesting. Now, what I was going to get to and why this inserter initially had a circuit condition is because what you can do if you don't want, like if you want this to auto launch or something, um, but you want it to only launch when you're low on packs, what you can do, right, is you have it auto launch with a satellite. But what you can do is you can take your wire and this actually makes a sound. I don't know if you could hear this, but that makes a little twangy sound is you can hook your chest or multiple chests up to your inserter. And you can just say work if there's less than say, uh, let's just say less than like, let's just say two stacks, 4,000. If there's less than 4,000, it'll insert a satellite. If there's more than 4,000, it won't insert a satellite. You won't launch rockets and you won't lose uh, science packs from it backing up, right? So that can be a really nice way to control that. Okay, so that takes care of the science. And uh, I guess next on the list would be infinite science. They have added infinite mining productivity research, which is this guy right here. So what this does is this makes your miners just globally across the entire world for any miners that are already down, any miners you place. It gives all your miners plus 2% productivity for each level. And the productivity acts exactly as if you were to put productivity modules in it um, or any other machine for that matter. It would work. This, it works the same way here, except you don't need the modules. So the first few levels are actually just red and green and then blue and some purple in the previous and then high tech. And after this, after level 16, I believe, because it starts at 17, uh, then it starts taking your space science packs, right? And then this is just infinite, right? There's only one icon like at this point, but you can just just research over and over just infinitely uh, and it gets more and more expensive. They go up by a hundred per level. So uh, it slowly adds up. So they added that they added infinite robot worker speed. So pretty much the how fast your robots fly and the up until level seems about it. Actually, these ones, these are just your base ones that we've always had. And then it seems like just after that, they start requiring your space packs. And these get very expensive. These are exponential. Uh, so essentially it 
each one costs twice the amount of the previous, which is pretty ridiculous. So these add up very quickly. And then they also added infinite research for pretty much every single combat damage thing in the game. Not shooting speed, because that would get out of hand. Uh, but even the damage ones get out of hand. Uh, I mean, whatever. Rocket damage, infinite. Uh, tank, uh, cannon shell damage, infinite. Bullet damage, infinite. Grenade damage, shotgun shell, laser, gun turret, flamer turret, or flamethrower damage, infinite. That would get super out of hand. Uh, follow robot count, infinite. And combat robot damage, infinite. And then they've also added... I can find it here. They've, they've also added cannon shell shooting speed uh, up to level 5 as well. And also they've added train braking force, which allows trains to brake quicker, right? So if we go back to level 1 here, train braking force bonus plus 10%. And it's just 15% uh, then, 15%. If it, okay, so then 15% each time after that which is super nice. It allows your trains to essentially go faster for longer because they can break quicker, which means they don't have to break as soon, right? So that takes care of that. Uh, let's see. When you die in multiplayer, you leave behind a corpse or a body with your items that slowly decay, uh, decay. So I can't really show that here because I'm not a multiplayer, but if you do die in multiplayer, uh, it does leave behind your body where you died, which will stay for 15 minutes, I believe. And you can go back there and just open and open up your body, essentially, and uh, grab all the stuff you had on you and re-equip it. So it's essentially like some of the mods that have existed previously, like the Gravestone mod and such. Uh, but now it's built in, which is super cool. And uh, now we'll move on to power. So let's go ahead and head over here to power, because these are the big ones. Actually, before we do power, let's go ahead and just quickly cover the HD graphics because these are pretty important. You'll notice, first of all, got new rails that look absolutely fantastic. And then here I've laid out all the items that are now in HD. And as 015 progresses like through the multiple stages, they will be adding HD graphics uh, for all of the items in the game. But currently, uh, just with this initial release, we have the cars now in HD, locomotive, cargo wagon, all splitters, all undergrounds, and all belts, which look absolutely amazing. Pipes, underground pipes, which look even better, I'd say, uh, than the belts. I mean, these just look fantastic, especially with stuff in them. Uh, the pump, this is what the small pump used to be. It's completely redone. Also, the electric furnace, the assembler machine, the steam engine, the uh, refinery, and the chemical plant. So this is currently what we have in HD, as well as rail signals, rail chain signals, and stations. So there's that. Now, next thing while we're over here, I do want to get to power, but while we're here, this should be easy enough. Um, you can now color stations the same color as a train. So let's change him just so there's some variety. Uh, let's just do, let's do that, like a pinkish purple. If you shift right click and copy this and paste it by shift left clicking to the station, it now color codes a station to the train, which is very, very nice. So you can now have matching stations to your trains. Um, and down here, as you will probably looking at, we now have a liquid tanker. So this will carry liquids, obviously. And you use these pumps. They're the same pumps, but you can see this is one of my favorite parts of this. They now raise up and attach to the top of this to fill it or empty it. And all we're doing here is barreling it or unbarreling it just to show this. Speaking of which, while we're here, um, they have now added the ability to barrel every single liquid in the game. And I think based on how it reads in the changelog, this should be able to tie into any mod as well. Um, so you pretty much no longer need a mod to barrel. It's built into the game which is really really nice so i'm going to turn this on just so you can see you can see these guys going uh they're pumping and a couple other cool features with this guys if you well first of all if you hover over this it shows center tank uh, front tank center tank and back tank it shows the temperature of the liquid inside and how much per tank 
if you open this, it shows you how much per tank. And this is this is the really cool part. You can separate this out. If I do this, this becomes a separate wagon. Now visually, of course it doesn't because that would be uh, very difficult to do. Um, but what this means is that this one is now detached in terms of liquid transfer to these two. So if I wanted, I could put an entirely different liquid in this one and then another type in this these two. Or if you want three different liquids, you just hit this. You now have three separate containers essentially here. So you can input three different liquids and they won't mix. And it will show you here how much is in each one. And then just do this to reconnect them. I would suggest not doing that. If you have three different liquids, don't connect them all together uh, before you until you empty it. But that's really, really cool. And last thing to do uh, with the liquids just for a minute while we're here, because a few you guys might have noticed, they have multiplied all fluids in the game by 10, just a straight up uh, multiplication of 10 to kind of get rid of like decimals and integers and stuff. So you'll notice that these now hold 250 uh, when they previously held 25. So again, just a very simple multiply by 10. Uh, this thing, you were probably wondering how this could hold so much. Uh, it was just multiplied again all by 10. Same with the storage tank here, the amount it could hold 2,500 previously, it can now hold 25,000. And these I think are three times the capacity of a storage tank. So this can in total hold 75,000 liquid, which is pretty awesome. So that, that takes care of that. Now let's head over to the power because this is, this is what I'm particularly excited about. Let me get a drink really quick. Okay, so I know you're going to be ogling at this, but I want to cover the steam really quick. So these are now your boilers. They've completely redone boilers in terms of pretty much everything. Uh, previously, you'll remember the boilers were, I think, just one by one, maybe one by two. Um, they are now two by three, and they look entirely different. Very, very cool. They look much better, I think. And they also have different uh, heat output and just different mechanics. So what you what happens here, right, is it inputs the water. I'm going to turn my advanced info on. It inputs the water through the front and it can or it can go through the back here, pretty much just straight across. It passes through, heats it, and then puts it out as steam. Okay, because the engines now use steam. Previously, you sent the water through the boilers to heat the water and the water went into the steam engines and then they worked, which didn't entirely make sense. Uh, but now you just output the steam out the side here and I'm just looking, these look so great in HD. Um, and it uses the steam. And you can also run between them too, you'll notice. Well, through here at least. So in terms of fuel, because people might be wondering, you pretty much have to insert your fuel here Actually, though, since these are 2 by 3 you can see the hitbox there, that red square. You could insert fuel uh, pretty much anywhere there's not a pipe. Since it does have that, it, that larger size, right, you could insert it somewhere else. Um, so, another thing about these is they output steam at a flat 165 degrees. Uh, you'll remember in 014, you had to use multiple boilers to actually get your water up to 100 um, if you're going to feed it into multiple steam engines. This just outputs a flat 165 degree steam. These, the max temperature these can use, the steam engines now, is 165, so it's just automatically, uh, you know, perfect. And you do notice I have two here. When you put multiples, you don't lose temperature, you lose compression, essentially. So this can support, uh, it is an exact ratio now that one boiler can support two steam engines. So what I've done here is I have one pump which can now pump 1,200 a second. You can see it actually says pumping speed down there. And, uh, and this is hooked to 20 boilers all in a line. It's just what, passing the water through, which is powering 40 steam engines, just two off of each one, right? So this is actually a very beefy power system because not only is this 40 steam engines, they've also increased the power output of a steam engine to 900 kilowatts now, opposed to the... 510 I believe it was previously so this guy is now 900 kilowatts all right so this is now a 36 megawatt system this can now produce 36 megawatts of power now there are of course probably way more efficient 
ways to lay this out in terms of space. I just threw this together for an example. Um, but yeah, and you'll notice we're not really drawing much power, so these aren't working nearly as fully. And I do have a random steam engine somewhere, not here. But uh, but yeah, so for just for example's sake, if we were to disconnect this, right, and I were to add more steam engines on here, uh, this would start losing some compression if it were actually drawing full power. You can see down there performance, we're barely using any, uh, but if it were drawing full power, it would start losing compression steam-wise and then just, uh, you know, just not work. And to show you the awesome graphics, you can now see the steam in here. It's pretty cool. So that's that. That's uh, the good ratio now. It was 114.10, if you remember. It is now uh, 120 40. And you can probably do different variations of that in different layouts. Of course, that'll be figured out as we go on, uh, you know, through the next couple weeks. But now onto the super exciting part, nuclear. This is probably one of the most anticipated biggest things that has been added is nuclear. So how does this work? It's a little bit of a compli complicated process um, until you kind of understand how it works. And then it's actually fairly straightforward, um, aside from the actual logistics of hooking everything up. So first of all, we have our centrifuge, which is really, really cool. <laughs> it, it looks cool just like this, but wait until you see it working. So what this guy does is he takes uranium ore, which is a new ore. You can see uh, all of our green here. And there's some other features you're noticing in the map, which I will point out shortly. Um, but there's uranium ore, which you mine. And this guy takes it. So I'm just going to I'm just going to go grab some just to show you him working because it is really cool. You can see the drills on uranium ore have a special graphic as well, um, and they require sulfuric acid. So this is where the nuclear starts, essentially, is you have uranium ore, and you put your drills on it. These are the same old mining drills. It's just when you put them over uranium, you get these special graphics, which are super nice, and you have to input sulfuric acid. Now. Don't worry, this doesn't actually take much. In fact, if you hover over this, it'll actually tell you 10 sulfuric acid per 10 ore. So it's essentially one per ore, which may seem like quite a bit if you're used to the 0, 014 numbers, but do remember that all fluids are multiplied by 10. So each one of these barrels actually holds 250, right? So this is actually essentially one barrel is worth 250 pieces of ore, which is pretty good. So we'll grab some of this and head over to our reactor or our centrifuge here, throw this guy in, and man, this looks so cool working. So what this does is this takes your uranium ore, processes it, it's a pretty long process, 10 seconds, and it gives you uh, U-235 and U-238. This is 235 and this is 238. Now I've spawned in a bunch of this, but it gives you the 235 and 238 in different ratios. Um, it gives you a lot more, like a lot, lot more 238 than it does 235. There's a very slim chance, and I believe initial calculations by Mad Zuri uh, are, it gives you, there's about a 0.7% chance, or it gives, it's either 0.7% chance that it will give you a 235, or it's 0.7% of the time. I think it's 0.7% of the time um, it gives you a piece of 235 from the process. So it's a very, very rare occurrence that you do get one of these from the process. So you will want to have a ton of this, right? If you actually want to get um, some 235 initially. Now there's some other processes we'll go over here shortly, which allow you to kind of get it at higher quantities. But, uh, but yeah, so once you do that, you get your 238 and once in a while some 235. So let's just say that this made six. I spawned it, of course, but let's just say we got six from this. Okay, then what we do is we take some of the 238 and some of the 235 and some iron, and we go into an assembler and we make uranium fuel cells. Okay, so it takes 10 iron, one 235, and 19 238. Okay, so it's a one to 19 in terms of the ore, but do remember that we get a ton more of the uh, 238 anyway. And this recipe will give you 10 fuel cells. So I'm going to power this on. And we'll see here that this guy's going to load some stuff in. 
might help if I used a stack inserter. And he's going to process this and give us 10 fuel cells per process, right? So we get these 10 fuel cells. This is what you put into this awesome looking guy over here. This is your nuclear nuclear reactor. Okay, so you take these fuel cells. Each one is essentially eight gigajoules worth of fuel. So you put these in here and it will give you a used up uranium fuel cell, which we'll go over what you can do with that in a minute. But what this guy does, okay, so essentially what's happening here, right? Is this is this is this would take over your steam power setup once you get to this stage in the game. You do have to unlock it, uh, which does come somewhat late in the game, um, a little bit. It takes only blue science, a thousand of each, so moderately expensive. Once you get to blue science, you can start creating nu nuclear stuff. Um, so once you get to that point, this is what would pretty much take over your steam. You can kind of intercombine them, but it's very inefficient to do so. So I would suggest just sticking to the nuclear components once you're able to actually do that. So essentially what this is doing is this guy acts as the fuel that you would put into a boiler because all it's doing is creating heat. Literally all this does is it takes fuel and it creates heat, which is sent out through these heat pipes which are their own entity now. There's these guys here. And you'll notice there are quite a few places where you can actually hook this up. There's two on each corner. So two, four, six, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So there's 12 hookup potential spots here. And you just lay these down. They're like belts and the fact that you can just walk straight over them, which is nice. So what this does is this creates heat and this transfers heat through these to your heat exchangers, which look almost identical to boilers, but they are not the same thing. Well, they essentially do the same thing, but they're different items, just, uh, just so you don't get them confused here. So what this does is this essentially produces 40 megawatts worth of heat. It says energy consumption, which is misleading, uh, but it does produce 40 megawatts worth of heat. Each heat exchanger consumes 10 megawatts worth of heat. So essentially each one of these reactors can support up to four of these heat exchangers. So what happens is you take your water, you input it into here, and then it acts just like a boiler. It essentially heats up your water from, it gets its heat from the heat pipe, which it gets from the reactor, right? You input your water and it creates steam. It outputs the steam, but it outputs it at a much higher temperature. These output the steam at 500 degrees. Now you'll see it's not actually doing anything. Uh, this is because uh, it actually has to get up to 500 degrees and this guy takes a while to get up there. You can see it's slowly increasing. Uh, but once these do hit that point, it'll output 500 degrees steam. And then you send these into your steam turbines, which are very, they're pretty much uh, steam engines, but much more powerful. Each one of these guys can produce 5.8 megawatts of power, right? So, this right here is pretty much what I would consider a good ratio, okay? Now you'll notice there's only three of these, but the ratio that we're looking for here is between the heat exchangers and uh, the turbines, right? Because if you have too many turbines compared to your heat exchangers, it's the same thing that's gonna happen to your steam power. You're gonna lose steam pressure and then these just won't work fully, right? And if you have too many heat exchangers, the turbines, it's just a waste of heat and energy and fuel cells and stuff. So essentially each one of these guys can support 1.6 steam turbines. So even though a reactor can support four of these, it doesn't really work out that well to do that. Uh, because things get a little bit wonky, but you, you could. So there's several ways you could do this. You could either do one to three to four uh, because Three of these heat exchangers can support 4.8 turbines. Uh, if you went to five, it would be a little bit overload and you would start losing pressure. Um, if you wanted to do four of these guys, then you could do um, actually six turbines. So let's go ahead and actually do that here really quick. Let's just throw one of these guys down and hook up a heat pipe. And you don't actually have to have a heat pipe coming off of each output. It'll just 
you can just do a straight line and the heat seems to transfer through these almost indefinitely across distance uh, so this guy's still slowly heating up so this will go through here create steam and this should support six turbines considering my math is correct so let's go ahead and add some more turbines I'm gonna get rid of this and you can just line these up like this it'll work totally fine and each one of these will produce 5.8 megawatts so this is actually a fairly beefy system here with six of these guys this is 34 megawatts worth of power which is almost equivalent to this but you can see the footprint is so much smaller and I'm, I'm not even trying to be space efficient this is actually very space inefficient the way I'm doing this but your footprint is way way smaller than this not to mention it just looks so cool uh, but once this guy heats up, which he's very close, you'll see the stuff start working, and the animations in these are absolutely brilliant. So we're going to sit here for just another second or two to see this guy working. You can see him start to work, and we did actually, we have gotten one of these. So like I said, it's very rare. And there we go. These are 500. These are heated up and now outputting 500 degrees steam. You can see there on the right, 500 degrees, 100. It's going through all these. And they're turning very slowly just because we have very low power consumption. If we had higher power consumption, um, these guys would be spinning away like crazy. But uh, they also produce very cool smoke. If we go here and turn on smoke, we can see uh, that, well, once they speed up, they would start producing some steam, which is pretty awesome. So I'm going to turn on my clouds too, just in case. That covers that. Now in terms of other processes you can do, what you can do is you can take these depleted or these used up uranium cells, take a centrifuge and you can turn these back into uh, U238. Um, it does require five used up cells, um, but per five you get three uh, 238 pieces which you can then run through either stick them in here to do more of this or you can use this other process which is the Coforex enrichment process and what this guy does is he takes five uranium 238 so right you could take the products from this and stick it through this process it takes five of those and 40 235s which seems like a lot and it is a lot because it takes forever to get them but then it outputs 41 235. So you're essentially getting an extra one 235 from this whole process at the cost of some 238. Because you can see it takes five 238 and outputs two of it. So essentially overall, when it's all said and done, at the cost of three pieces of U238, you get a piece of U235. And uh, this actually gets very overpowered if you put productivity modules in. Just a quick tip there. I'm sure they're going to patch it because it's definitely not intended. It gets way out of hand. Um, but there's some different ways you can get that, which is quite nice. So that takes care of all that. That's a nuclear. That, uh, that was really the longest part. These other things here are kind of shorter. Uh, just really nice quality of life stuff. And uh, one or two major, somewhat major other things we're going to go through here. So let's go ahead and head down this way. Two things I'm going to show you here. First off, uh, your different fuels now increase acceleration and top speed of vehicles. You can see here when you mouse over this, vehicle acceleration 120%, and for your rocket fuel, vehicle acceleration 180%. Uh, coal doesn't actually like say, so I'm assuming it's just base. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, but this affects any vehicles, whether it be a car, whether it be a tank, uh, trains. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little train race here, guys, just to show you. This guy's loaded up with coal, this guy's loaded up with solid fuel, and this guy's loaded up with rocket fuel. They're going to blast down this track, go to these stations. Hopefully I can have them all go at somewhat the same time. Um, but even though this guy gets a head start, you'll see that I'm going to blast past them probably. You can see the difference. This guy started way before us, and we're blasting past him. And of course, it's a very short distance, but just the acceleration alone is huge for your trains. It helps them get through junctions faster and leave where they're going faster and get there faster because uh, it does add a slight bit of top speed as well. So that takes care of that. 
we're over here now to oil. So I already mentioned universal barreling and the 10 times multiplier to liquid. Now, in terms of balancing, they've done some changes. Um, there's quite a few. The main ones I want to cover, though, here have to do with oil. They've changed the cracking recipe, so cracking heavy to light and light to petroleum. They've changed that process time to three seconds. Previously, it was five seconds, and now it's three. And this changes all the ratios. And I've actually laid out the now correct or now ideal ratio off of uh, initial calculations um, that myself and some others have done. Uh, this may improve, this may change in the future as more people go through it, but right now this is a good ratio. Before, if you remember, it was five refineries to one heavy to light cracker to seven uh, light to petroleum crackers. With this change of cracking recipe time, it is now eight refineries to one heavy to light to seven light to petroleum. So this number and this number is not changed, but since these recipes are two seconds faster, it's actually more refineries to actually support this system. Or if you look at it the other way, this system can support more refineries, right? So eight, seven, one, essentially. And now this is another pretty major thing. We now have a new recipe, coal liquefaction. And what you can do with this actually is you can get this to a point where you actually get all your oil products from coal instead of oil. It, you can get to a point with this, create a loop of itself to where you don't even need crude oil anymore. You can just feed it off of itself and some coal and water. Because you notice here on the recipe, it takes 10 coal, 25 heavy, and 50 water. But it outputs 35 heavy, 15 light, and 20 petroleum. So you might notice there that we're getting 10 heavy light oil, or 10 heavy light, 10 heavy oil, extra from the output compared to what we input, right? We input 25, we get out 35. So you can actually just cycle this back through itself. And as long as you have coal and water to feed it, you can literally just create your light and petroleum off of this without ever feeding crude oil into your system. Of course, it does take a lot of coal. I mean, it eats 10 coal per, which goes by pretty quick. Um, so this is really meant to be in addition to your oil you know, because late game, you don't really do much with coal except plastic. But this is very cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this guy, these guys on. And uh, yeah, so you can create an infinite loop of itself if you so choose, of course. But those are going to barrel. This guy is going through here. And now we just need a couple water barrels. So I'm just going to throw some water barrels in here. And this guy goes, you can see He's going to spit out the stuff, and I'll just throw some empty barrels in here. And it's actually feeding back through itself. You see, I've just hooked this heavy pipe back up, and if I had the actual coal to support it, it would feed back through itself and just continue pretty much forever as long as it had the coal and uh, water to supply itself and didn't back up. So that's a really new cool process if you're having oil problems which I doubt you ha you'll have because this brings uh, me to another somewhat balancing change in regards to oil spawns. So what they do is, is they have uh, reduced the amount of like patches on the map so that they're not as frequent. You know, I mean, you see how, how frequent these guys are, right? Uh, but what they've done to kind of offset that in buff oil is they've increased the minimum yield from 10% to 20%. They've halved the rate of depletion, so it essentially uh, depletes only half as quickly as it used to. And they've doubled the starting yield. In addition to that, the minimum yield of an oil well now depends on the starting yield of the oil well. So if you have an oil well that starts at, say, 3.6 a second, it'll only go down to 0.36 a second opposed to 0.1 a second like it would previously. Okay, so some pretty major oil buffs there as well. Let's go ahead and move on to the next biggest thing I would say, which is some map improvements. Pretty, uh, pretty big stuff here. So if we open our map, there's a few things you can see here over on the right. You can have your logistics networks toggled, which let me go ahead and put down a row report just to show you. Let 
we go into map here and we toggle our robo port, you can now see on your map your robo port, your construction coverage, and your logistics coverage. And this will work for all robo ports on your map. Uh, you can also see your electric network. You can see essentially where my network runs, which is very cool. You can see your turret coverage. Uh, so let's go ahead and put down, let's just say, some turrets here. Turret coverage, you can see that. Your pollution, you can toggle your pollution on and off. Train stop names and player names. Not only that, now when you mouse over a research, which you probably saw earlier, a research, a resource, it'll tell you how much is in it, which is super nice. So this is like a built-in uh, resource monitor. If you mouse over these, this is crude oil, uh, crude oil combined yield, 414%. This will now tell you how much is in each entire patch. Uh, they've also added new map colors, you can probably tell, kind of similar to the enhanced map colors mod. Uh, you can also select trains from the map view you see here i click him i can now open these from the map view no matter where they are i can just open them you can also label things so let's just if i just click here just left click i can name this oil base and you can put icons so let's just uh let's just use a refinery and this is now permanently on my map i can get rid of it of course if it's in the way i want to change it but you can now label sections of your base that you can see in the map and last, probably one of my favorite things is wherever there is radar coverage or a player, you can, if you're in the map and you zoom in far enough, it'll take you straight in to normal view. So I'm just going to zoom in and it, yes, it is supposed to be grainy like this. It's kind of like a, like, you know, like a transmission. I can go in here and I can, I can't change stuff. Uh, I can change trains actually through this, which is cool, but you can see what's going on, right? So if you're a multiplayer and your, your friend's like, you know, hey, you know, look at, uh, you know, I'm over at the rocket silo, check out how fast I'm launching rockets. You don't have to go all the way over there. You can, if he's there or there's a radar, you can just go to your map, scroll in and see exactly what's happening here live. If you just scroll back out, it'll pull you back out. Now, again, I can't do this like over here because there's no radar, but uh, if there were, I could do it there as well and i think we're almost done guys i know this is a very long video there's so much here and these are just the major things this is not even close to the entire change log um let's see another big thing is the blueprint library so we go up here or hit b if i were actually in my game hit b now your blueprint library you'll notice in your crafting menu you can no longer make blueprint planners or decon de blueprints or deconstruction planners. You just hit this and you get them for free. If I do this, I now get these guys for free and you can get them at the start of the game. And uh, so this is how you export. You can export your strings, you can import strings, I believe. Um, if you actually go into a blueprint, you can just export your string directly. You can see here, export string. Okay, so that takes care of that bit. And then you have your, uh, your kind of storage here, your blueprint storage in your library, which is where you can transfer blueprints between your saves. Um, game blueprints, if you're a multiplayer, it'll actually show you all the player blueprints, of, like any blueprints players had um, that were in that game. Super nice. Your blueprint book now has like a bajillion different slots. Um, it can actually hold up to a thousand blueprints now, which is pretty ridiculous. Um, so that that's that bit and then your deconstruction planner they have now added filter deconstruction planner options to the normal game so if i right click this we now have different options we can tell it to only delete trees so if i do that and oh he's now licensing that nice little icon so if i select all this you can see it's not even selecting my building it's just only selecting the trees and i'm going to deselect that um or we can tell it to whitelist or blacklist. So let's say whitelist and I don't want to get rid of refineries. Export to strings. So you can actually export filter deconstruction planners, I think, which is very cool. Uh, so if we do this, this means it only selects your refineries, right? So out of all this, it's only selecting my refineries. The reverse of that, of course, would be blacklist which theoretically should mean that it selects everything except my refineries, which it does. 
So you can now filter blue uh, deconstruction planners exactly how you like. You can also do tiles, which is pretty cool. So that takes care of that. Uh, I'm just scrolling down my list here. Did that. Um, there are now two new scenarios, PvP and wave defense. I'm not going to show the wave defense, but that's something you can expect some videos on definitely at some point. A very fun multiplayer thing, I suspect. Um, let's see. All fluids. Uh, they now added fluids to the production GUI. Let's see here, fluids. Uh, currently, I'm doing 1.1k water a minute. If we look in the last... 10 minutes, you can see how much liquids I've done. Uh, buildings, they've now added kill statistics. If you hit K, of course, I haven't done, well, last 10 hours, I've killed some trees. So you can see there, uh, it will show players. It should show some buildings, stuff like that. And uh, let's go ahead and look at, so we did that, train stops. The research technology shows the uh, actual packs that they require now underneath it. Here you can see red green, which requires all of them. A pipette tool. This is very cool. This is pretty much identical to the picker mod, picker tool. So the default key for this is Q, uh, which used to be the key to switch weapons. Uh, that key has now been changed to tab. You can, of course, re uh, rebind these. But if I mouse over something and hit Q, it'll bring up that thing in my cursor to build. So if I mouse over this and hit Q, and I have a pipe, hit Q, I have an assembler, so on and so forth. If you mouse over a, a patch of resource, it'll bring up the fastest mining tool you have available. So let's go over here to resources, hit Q, we get a miner. Speaking of which, resources now have new graphics, absolutely beautiful, coal, um, you saw the uranium, which looks fantastic. Stone, which I think is actually one of the best looking. Uh, very, very cool. So that takes care of that. Um, some damage stuff. Tons and tons of damage changes and buffs. I'm not going to go over all of them. You can check them out in the changelog. But in regards to that, they've now added uranium rounds, uranium cannon shells, uranium explosive cannon shells, and an atomic bomb, which is really expensive. 30 of the very rare uranium plus other stuff. So let's start with these uranium rounds. They do a ton of damage. Like, unbelievable. I can literally just nuke everything, pretty much. Tons and tons of damage. And when you can count in uh, infinite bullet damage, you can see it's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, let's try a nuclear bomb. This thing has a gigantic blast radius, so you actually need to run after you shoot it, or you're going to blow yourself up, essentially. Uh, so let's go ahead and launch it in here. Boom. <laughs> and it's all dead. It's essentially uh, a buffed up ion cannon, if you ever play with that mod, is essentially what this is. Okay, so there's that. Uh, let's go ahead and... I want to get myself a tank here really quick, just so I can show you. So, first off, let's start with uranium cannon shell. This guy does quite a lot of damage. Uh, 400 plus 120 explosion. So, a little bit out of range. You can see it just pretty much obliterates everything. And much faster, too. Much faster uh, shooting speed on that one. So then, let's go ahead and... Let's, uh, let's see if we can... We can clear these guys out. Again, much shoot, uh, faster shooting speed. Let's go ahead and take that out and do our explosive rounds. These ones are very cool. And I think we're almost done, guys. I know, again, I know this is very long. I'm sorry. And uh, it's supposed to be an overview, but I'm really going as fast as I can. There's so much. So you can see, this thing is pretty ridiculous. Okay, so that takes care of that. Uh, entity... Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and just hop out and just kill these guys. Alright. 
So let's head back to the main base because there's just the last couple things here that are very cool kind of quality of life stuff to go over. Uh, on our way back, they also added the programmable speaker. You can do a ton of stuff with this, hook it up to Combinator Circuit Network. Um, you can have it output like sounds and uh, you can actually create like little songs with it as well. So if we like take this guy and hook it to here, you can see that now you can choose, you know, what do you want? Drum kit. Um, so we'll just take this and do like that. And uh, so on and so forth. I'm not good with combinators, but you can figure that out. Very cool. You can now output sounds, custom alerts throughout your map, so on and so forth. Uh, let's see. So programming out speaker. Uh, so next one. Entities. Entity settings can be pasted by dragging instead of clicking every entity one at a time. So if you remember, if I right shift right click this, I copy it. Before I had to shift left click each one of these, if I just hold my left mouse button down and run, it'll just copy all of them. Same goes for chess. This one, if I shift right click this and just run with my left mouse button down, copies or paste all of that to there. Um, if you paste from an assembler to a filter inserter, it will set the filter to the items that are required for this essentially. So if I set that, it just sets it to iron and copper. Speaking of which, you can now individually set insert a stack size bonuses either here, override, let's just say two, or you can do it through the network as well, through your circuit network. Okay, which I'm not entirely sure I would imagine it could be just as simple as doing, let's just do uh, two uh, set. So let's, um, let's have this be like four or three. And let's do this and uh, set stack size control signal two. I'm actually very bad with combinators, so I'm not entirely sure. Ample condition, uh, let's just say If to, yeah, so so on and so forth. There's that. Um, ability to change a personal robot mark two. You now have a level two robot which has a higher robot limit. And uh, robot limit construction area 40 by 40 compared to 30 by 30, so an upgrade there. Um, night vision now looks different, which I won't really go into. You can test that out yourself. Mining drills, pump jacks can be turned on and off with circuit network. Train stops can output the contents of stop trains. Train can uh, train stops can be disabled using the circuit network. Um, so trains will essentially just skip a train stop that's disabled, just kind of ignore it completely. Um, added some new signs to decider combinators. So take one of these guys. There's now these signs less than. Uh, yeah, so there's that less than equal to more than equal to and some more uh, Covered that Furnaces and assemblers now show amount of products produced and I believe pretty much everything does at this point So like this guy uh, products finished 238 products finished six uh, Just by messing over it there uh, in the in the right You now have a screenshot command. So if I just do screenshot, it should have just taken a screenshot for me. And I think that's about it, guys. Uh, pump pumping speed increased by four. So the what was the small pump uh, now now pumps four times faster. Essentially, a uh, bunch of balancing changes reduced uh, plastic bar recipe requirement of petroleum. Reduce electric engine recipe requirement of lubricant. Reduce electric furnace recipe requirement of steel. Uh, pump jack requirement of steel. Steel furnace requirement of steel. And crafting times of some stuff. And that, I believe, covers all the main things. Uh, increased rate at which resources grow with distance from center by 50%. So essentially, 
Uh, the farther out you get from spawn now, um, things are increased 50% more than they previously were. Um, added a favorite option to server browser. Um, added a alerts command, configure alerts for your player. So if you just do alerts, you can enable, disable, mute, unmute, alert. So I would just type whatever alert that I want to change with the way I want to change it in front of it. And I could do that. I believe that's it for the main features here, guys. Thank you so much for staying with me through this, if you managed to. I know it was very long. There was so very much to cover. Probably the biggest patch yet. Uh, link in the description for the full change log. I'll also link my notes that you can read through. And uh, hopefully I didn't miss anything. I do apologize if this was long. I did go as quickly as I could while still trying to explain everything. And uh, if you did enjoy, I would very much appreciate a like. And uh, I'd love to hear thoughts down in the comments. All the excitement and hype for 15. Any thoughts you have in regards to these changes as well. And uh, yeah, I will see you very shortly. And many, many more videos coming out this week. But uh, until then, I look forward to seeing you all. Well.